Hi, everyone. I'm Raj Kumar, president and editor-in-chief of DevX. This week, we'll be breaking down the big headlines in global development and bringing in some top experts to help us do it. If you want to follow along with the stories we're talking about, check out devx.com and subscribe to our daily newsletter, The Newswire. There's a link in the description. Follow us along on Twitter, and you can see many of the stories we're talking about today. And we'd love to hear what you think. This is This Week in Global Development. Hi, I'm Kate Warren, Executive Vice President and Executive Editor at DevX. You're listening to DevX at South by Southwest, our special edition of This Week in Global Development. The annual South by Southwest conference in Austin, Texas, is known for its eclectic mix of innovators and policymakers. It's a unique place where film stars and artists co-mingle with tech entrepreneurs and social change makers to discover new ideas and spark inspiration. Increasingly, it's also become a hotspot for global development leaders looking to break out of the usual event circuit echo chamber. I'm here at South by to talk with the leaders about ways that technology and innovation can supercharge the sustainable development goals. Listen in for what's next in a range of sectors from food to health to climate and conflict and how these advancements can reach the most vulnerable. While digital technologies have transformed healthcare in high-income countries, there's less awareness of the impacts of digital health in low-resource settings or in crisis zones. At South by Southwest, I met with two doctors turned social entrepreneurs who are focused on just that. Dr. Jerome Lee is co-founder of Health Tech Without Borders, a nonprofit organization leveraging digital technology to provide access to health resources in the context of humanitarian disasters. And Dr. Rupan Gill is the CEO and co-founder of Vitala Global Foundation, a nonprofit organization that works with girls and women to develop digital solutions for stigmatized sexual and reproductive health issues, including abortions. We'll hear from Jerome about his work in Ukraine, from Rupan about her work in Venezuela, and from both of them about the opportunity for digital to deliver in these challenging contexts. Let's start with Jerome. Outside of his work with Health Tech Without Borders, he's an associate professor at Harvard Medical School and the vice chief of critical care for the Division of Trauma, Emergency Surgery, Surgical Critical Care at Massachusetts General Hospital. I caught up with him after a panel he participated at here in South By on ways that telemedicine and chatbots are supporting humanitarian crises around the world with a focus on Ukraine. So I want to hear a little bit about your work and what you're obviously, so this is a very tech focused conference. Um, I think there's a lot of discussion around how tech can enable um, you know, advancements in North America, um, but maybe a little less uh, talking about how that can help advance the global south. Um, and you know, you mentioned you're here talking about Ukraine, but also the other context you work in. So, what are some of the big issues you're focused on right now, and some of the you know maybe exciting things you're working on on health technologies? I think that it's very interesting because I think we're at this growth period. In many ways, it's one of the silver linings from COVID. You know, uh, especially as a, I'm an emergency medicine ICU physician, um, COVID was a interesting time for us <laughs> in so many ways. Uh, but what we saw was that telemed, digital health technology really accelerated during the time of crisis in a way that I've never seen in the past. Um, and we needed it, right? And I was one, of, I'll, I'll admit, I was one of those physicians that was like, telemed's kind of cool. I don't want anything to do with it <laughs> before COVID. Yeah. And then I sort of saw how it scaled in crises. And, and so me and a few of my partners got together and we were like, maybe we can support telem I mean, uh, Ukraine's effort uh, with the start of the war with telemedicine. And so uh, there was a call to action put out to the world to see uh, if folks can support both on the tech side as well as on the volunteer side. And it was incredible what the world community came together around. Over 40 tech companies came forward and wanted to offer their tech pro bono. And then over 800 volunteers wanted to uh, support clinicians, non-clinicians from over 20 countries. And personally, I was recruiting internally from my hospital system in Boston. And at one point I had to stop recruiting because everyone 
wanted to join, of course, and support. And it was great to see, but it was also overwhelming to a degree, <laughs> right? right? And so putting that all together, we ended up delivering over 62,000 consoles to Ukrainians within Ukraine by about November. And we did publish a lot of this to sort of immortalize our process for future efforts. And I could share that later if needed um, and continue to sort of do that work with telemedicine. So as you think about scaling this, right, and how this could be adapted in other contexts, um, and even maybe not even in a crisis situation. I think crisis gets people rallied around a cause, but you know, there's many places that have um, you know, lack of access to, to, to health care that this could be deployed to. So how do you think about being able to scale this in other contexts? Yeah, and that's key, right? And I think Ukraine's unique, conflict's unique, of course, and there was a specific crisis need in Ukraine, and also over COVID when we did a lot of telemedicine. But uh, sometimes I joke with my colleagues that we're offering Ukrainians better health care than a lot of Americans have in North America, just because of the access issues and, uh, you know, access to even digital health. It just there's medical islands all across even just our nation, right? Um, but I think we've moved beyond just Ukraine and we're focused on um, like Cameroon and Africa. We have a commitment to action with the Global Cl Clinton Global Initiative to try to set up a telemed system to better offer access to primary care for the climate affected and conflict affected refugees within Cameroon. But that's not an immediate crisis, it's an ongoing crisis like you said, right? And so I think digital health, telemedicine, chatbots, all of this gives us a further reach in a way that we've never had in the past and offers access to care, right, in a way that we've never been able to do either. So a big topic of conversation here um, in Austin and I think kind of everywhere is around AI, right, um, and both the, the amazing possibilities and opportunities and also the, you know, worries of, of AI, but um, so how are you thinking about the power of AI and really being able to transform healthcare? Yeah, AI is, I think, the conversation topic everyone is talking about. And I feel like even if it's not AI, it's AI, <laughs> right? Um, it's AI, so we, we did create a chatbot to support education around like putting on tourniquets, stop the bleed, um, programs and also a little more um, advanced program for uh, clinicians on the front lines in Ukraine teach them how to uh, do it's called tactical combat casualty care all in a chat bot it's funny we built the chat bot everyone thinks it's AI based but it's not it's actually it's artificial but it's not intelligent it's really all uh, tree logic however you know AI I think is the future right it can do so much in a way that we don't even understand yet Right? And we've seen the studies of how they're better at talking to patients than clinicians like myself. They just have the time and the patience in some ways. It's kind of funny. Uh, but I think even beyond that, I was just talking to one of our panelists who's a cancer physician, a cancer surgeon uh, from South by Southwest. And we were talking about how using current diagnostic technologies for cancer and augmenting that with AI will just make it all better. It'll make it probably more sensitive, more specific, more personalized and probably a lower cost, right, and with better access. And I think that's where it really adds value in the end. Um, I think the other big part of AI is there's just different forms we can use, right? One is definitely on the diagnostic side for whether it's cancer or something else, but adding AI to all the new devices that are coming out to, with all this large data, um, it'll be amazing to see what we can do. So like another big example is even with COVID, right? how do we allocate beds to the right patients so that we have the best capacity and take care of the right patients in the right place in the right time, right? And we try to do that with the systems we have, but I bet AI can look at these large data sets and even help us better move patients to the right centers or take care of them in a better way. But I don't know, I see a lot of great things, but I do worry too. <laughs> so I wanna talk a little bit about um, you know, mental health programming um, and you know, COVID. Obviously, the mental health challenges have been really, really extreme, and we've seen um, a real increase in mental health crises uh, around the world, um, and a real lack of mental health services and support. So how are you thinking about telemedicine and digital health and really helping to bridge that gap in, in mental health specifically? One of the big other silver linings is I think there's been more of a focus on mental health because of COVID, 
also not just within like the world and our general community but within the healthcare like clinicians need help as well right and there was a big focus on that and so one of our programs we decided to we knew that we wanted to help Ukraine and our uh, colleagues in Ukraine who do mental health in some way and uh, we did speak with other NGOs that were doing direct to patient care with um, you know beaming in like a mental health specialist from another country to support Ukrainians but we decided to actually change that a little bit and do it differently and we realized that we wanted to focus on taking care of the clinicians in Ukraine already taking care of their patients and so we created something called the 3H program led by Dr. Eva Regel who um, is a mental health specialist and amazing and she's been leading this effort where we have our external uh, EU-based or American-based um, Health Tech Without Borders mental health specialists doing essentially peer-to-peer -peer support for a good amount of mental health specialists within Ukraine so that they can continue doing their work. And majority, if not all of them, have said if we weren't around to support them, they probably would stop seeing patients or even stop completely uh, doing this work because they were seeing things that they never saw pre-war, of course. And certain things that they just also wanted support with, like trauma-informed care, sometimes pediatric patients that they weren't caring for pre previously, we were able to leverage and bring in our expertise from around the world to support them as well. Uh, but that peer-to-peer -peer support, I think, from the mental health side is key. Uh, the second project we have, and I think also, I think this is pertinent for everywhere, is that, uh, like you said, I think access to behavioral health and mental health is lacking in the U.S., of course, as we see. Uh, as well as everywhere else, right? <laughs> Just not enough uh, access to care. Um, but Telemed has really shown that we can do this and accelerate it. And if we look at the data, especially in Massachusetts, um, of course, uh, most of the mental health and uh, you know, uh, telemedicine visits all went to remote and telemedicine. And the number of visits that were being done were more than what was actually being seen pre-COVID. So more patients were having access to mental health support with this new system, and that continues to this day. So it has increased access, which is great, uh, which is great to see. But the denominator is still huge, right? If you think about the people who need help, and not everyone needs a mental health specialist. They might need something else. So we also partnered with a group in the UK called MindStep, and they have an incredible um, digital therapeutics, digital uh, diagnostic like app that will go through and diagnose someone uh, with low-level depression, anxiety, and a few other things. And it can treat it through an algorithm that's evidence-based. But at the same time, if you know, they, and the app identifies or the patient needs more help, it can exit into a real-life mental health specialist for support. And so we partnered with them really around Ukraine, knowing that we wanted to localize it culturally, linguistically, and sort of change the stories they use, right, to be contextually the right one for the refugees um, so that it can be used uh, for Ukrainians who need this as well. But I do think that we can use this for not just Ukrainian refugees, but all refugees and possibly everyone else. And I know that in the UK, I think they said they have over 80,000 subscribers already using this. So it seems to work well. Um, but with lack of access, we need other solutions on top of what we have. The world is facing a range of health threats from an increase in disease outbreaks to the health impacts of climate change. I'm Janelle Ravelo, Senior Global Health Reporter for DevEx. Every Thursday, we bring you exclusive news and insights on how the health sector is finding solutions to these challenges in our free weekly newsletter, DevEx Checkup. Visit devex.com newsletters to subscribe. Digital tools can be particularly valuable for stigmatized issues, from mental health to sexual and reproductive health. Vitalik Global Foundation was one of the winners of the South by Southwest Innovation Showcase with its innovative digital abortion companion app, Aya Contigo. The app launched in Venezuela in early 2022 amidst the country's humanitarian crisis as well as legal restrictions on reproductive care. Vitala developed the app in collaboration with over 1,000 Venezuelan girls and women, as well as grassroots organizations. 
I spoke with Vitala co-founder and CEO, Dr. Rupan Gill, about Aya Contigo's impact in Venezuela and here in the U.S. Congratulations is in order because you did win yes. um, last night. Maybe you can tell, uh, tell us a little bit more about Aya Contigo and the work that you're doing with that. Yeah, definitely. So I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. I usually try to say that first so people have a bit of context around my expertise and how close I am to the problem. Um, so I'm an OBGYN, but I did extra training in family planning, complex family planning. So I'm an abortion provider as well. I'm Canadian. Um, I've spent a lot of time working in global settings, particularly humanitarian settings. I was working for Doctors Without Borders. And at the time that I worked at both WHO and MSF, I had a lot of inspiration from um, seeing some of the things I really liked about the work, I, like those organizations, and then some of the challenges, especially around co-creating um, digital platforms or solutions that really center the user and the community. So at, our organization is called Vitala Global, and our flagship product is Aya Contigo. And at Vitala, we, we really do center the user and use a lot of design thinking and human-centered design, user-centric and community-centric principles. And through this work, and our focus has been in Latin America, specifically first, first and foremost is Venezuela, we co-created Aya Contigo, um, which is essentially a digital abortion um, and contraception companion. You could think of it kind of, kind of like a virtual doula in your pocket. Mm -hmm. And what we often say is that our app is not just a, you know, it's, it, it's, a pro, it's a progressive web app, but it's not just an app providing passive information because of the nature of how we've like done the user-centric work, we're really trying to see how it acts as a glue, as an ecosystem integrator, especially in this day and age where we have so much complexity around abortion access. So we're looking at ways that the digital can support the abortion seeker. And so one aspect that's really core to our work is the virtual chat that we have embedded within the app that has real-time people, you know, bots, it's like actual counselors that are providing accompaniment for our users, whether that's to combat misinformation, whether that's to access trusted resources, um, or just to provide psycho-emotional and social support. Wow, that's um, amazing. And so you did talk about being at WHO, MSF before, and you know, maybe some of the challenges of um, taking you know, technology and innovation and bringing it to scale and uses like this. What are some of the challenges you had in doing that? Um, and what are some of the partners and approaches you took to be able to really um, you know, take a more of a technology focused approach to solving some of these issues? I think, you know, it's interesting. I already, like before we even got started in the work, I was always interested in technology. I'd seen the benefit because I'd done so much work in the global space. Um, and also, I had been doing some work in some really like remote and complex places like northern Nigeria, Yemen. I've been in Malawi, I mean, a number of countries. So I already saw like the potential of tech, especially like when I would be in maternities, like all the women as they're waiting in labor to be checked, they're like on their smartphones or, or phones. So I think like that for, first and foremost was like an informed um, kind of decision in terms of looking at tech, the intersection of tech and reproductive justice and community, you know? And so we um, we have seen the potential and also I think what helps, what's been great in terms of like my expertise is because I've been at the level of WHO as well where we're, and I was working for the Preventing Unsafe Abortion Unit, supporting on some of the guidelines. And so I was always reviewing the evidence that's out there. So I already knew, you know, that there's all these ways that people are using technology specifically for abortion, whether it's like through hotlines or different apps or chatbots. So we, first and foremost, I had that, but then there are challenges. And I think the, the one of the major challenges, which, which is also why we do the user centric, because we had made no assumptions. Like we weren't saying Aya Contigo was going to be the solution. My question was, could a, could a digital solution be feasible and acceptable in a context like Venezuela to support people to self-manage their own abortions? And so then through that research, we learned a lot about the context, about you know the fact that they don't have electricity, so we need to make sure the app is going to be offline. The fact that uh, what kind of phones people have, so it needs to be really ultra like low weight for, for different telephones. Um, really kind of thinking about how people are engaging with WhatsApp versus email versus social media. So all of that has been like, built for but I think like the challenges are like a lot of our right now we're reaching a lot of people that are in the you know for example in Venezuela the urban peri-urban some rural settings as well 
but the it is kind of getting the access out to some of the most rural and remote so we have to kind of do that work with partners and to your other question um, I mean there's other challenges too and I would say they're not necessarily as, as much related to I would say I contigo as a tech I would say it's around the digital marketing and some of the big tech um, challenges we're facing around people blocking our ads or blocking um, Aya Contigo being able to get to the people. So like social media ads. What are some of the maybe political and legal barriers? Obviously um, here in the US, uh, we and particularly we're sitting in Texas, <laughs> which abortion rights have been severely curtailed. Um, and so as you think about both you as your company, um, doing work in the US and, and in Venezuela, but also your users. What are some of the challenges around that that you have to face? Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that we've always done and what we're doing is that our solution is, we, we say it's a harm reduction solution, so we're not necessarily the ones actually providing the pills or the services. So in a lot of ways, that has helped us to kind of work uh, around the law. I mean, we're doing it within a, the legal context right. and the legal framework. Um, so that's like very important to us and partners to us are lawyers and you know even in the US we have an amazing pro bono legal support and we're also partner with Planned Parenthood Federation of America and so they had to vet us and that all of that legal and the safeguarding stuff just to be able to work with these bigger partners so it actually vets us and sort of protects us but because we use this harm reduction model which is essentially saying that like people are going to do it like that's what's happening i mean pills are getting into people's hands in all 50 states um but our whole mission and and sort of goal is that if people are going to do it we want to make sure that they're going to do it safely because we know that if they're getting access to it sometimes in many contexts venezuela even that we're you know texas and other places like people are going to do it unsafely so our whole premise is like let's provide the information the accompaniment and guidance um, but safeguarding and cybersecurity and kind of following the legal frameworks is a, is a core pillar of our work. So we have a lot of processes, a lot of things that we put in place even before we launched in Venezuela, even before we launched in the U.S. And now we're, you know, venturing into Central America, starting with Guatemala, which is also very challenging. And what are some of the things you're excited about next or what are some future opportunities, expansion plans? What are you looking to do next? I mean, it's been so fascinating being on this journey because when we first started, the, the, it was like for Venezuela, like a country that's going through a crisis scenario, um, you know, restrictive abortion laws. It was it started like a project, really. Right. And um, and I really wanted to build this like localized solution for a globally connected problem. And that whole motto of like locally localized, but globally connected, I feel like it's becoming even more real because, you know, reproductive rights are under attack and some places we're making progress, but access is still an issue. And as I present in many different places, like I see like how relevant our solution is like globally. Yeah. I see expansion for our work globally. That's like my big vision, like that we get to the places that like need it the most. But I'm really excited for like the ongoing deepening impact we're doing in Venezuela, working with young people. Um, uh, now we're going to do a lot of work with rural communities and looking at how the app can, can work. I mean, Venezuela is like the soul and the core. That's where everything started. I'm excited about our expansion plans for the U.S. So, for example, now winning this, you know, the innovation showcase. So looking at ways with our ongoing partnership with Planned Parenthood Federation of America, which has been really great. Um, to be able to like just leverage that and, and reach more people and now um, entering a new market. So we have like an ongoing project that we've done in Venezuela. We're going to deepen our impact as well in the U.S. and then start in Guatemala this year. Um, but it, and essentially, I would like to see us kind of in, in many as many places as possible, especially in LATAM in the next couple of years. Thanks for listening to DevX at South by Southwest, a special edition of This Week in Global Development. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it, or you can also leave us a rating or a review. Make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast streaming platform. If you want to share feedback on this episode or have any questions you'd like answered, we'd love to hear from you. Drop me a message on social media at Kate D. Warren or send an email to podcast at devx.com. DevX at South by Southwest is a podcast from DevX. It's hosted by me, Kate Warren. Today's episode was produced by Catherine Cheney and edited by Naomi Mihara.